Thanks, Chiming. Um, okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so today um, I wanted to cover a fairly practical topic uh, as it relates to echocardiography, and that's the assessment of uh, LV ejection fraction uh, and, uh, you know, make it useful for both the readers and for the sonographers who uh, acquire the images to allow us to assess the LV ejection fraction. So the overview of the, um, uh, of the, of the talk today is shown on this slide. First of all, we'll discuss very briefly the evaluation of LV systolic function and the LV ejection fraction. We'll go over quickly how to, how to measure LV ejection fraction using the most commonly used technique uh, currently, which is uh, 2D Simpsons biplane. Recognize some of the pitfalls uh, and issues with the determination of LV ejection fraction. And then, of course, we, we will learn how to, to implement uh, echo contrast uh, or, uh, as it's now termed, uh, ultrasound enhancing agents to help improve the accuracy and reproducibility of LV ejection fraction measurements. So I think we all recognize the, the prognostic value of LVEF. We know it's not a perfect measure of LV systolic function, but it's, it's the one that has been studied the most and has the most prognostic information. Um, this is uh, just some data from uh, a number of years ago uh, in one of the early uh, thrombolytic uh, trials for uh, SE segment elevation myocardial infarction. This is from the JISI-2 study um, uh, comparing different types of thrombolytic therapies. And you can see um, as the LV ejection fraction uh, uh, falls um, along the x-axis here, you can see the six-month mortality uh, post uh, STEMI increases uh, exponentially. And we know the value, uh, 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 prognostic value of LVF goes uh, even beyond uh, the ejection fraction measurement and into volume. So the, the measurement of volumes actually becomes important as well. This is a, an also an old study from Harvey White from 1983 uh, showing that even within a certain class of ejection fraction, let's say mildly reduced EF with the left graph 40 to 49%, or uh, a more moderate or severe LV systolic dysfunction ejection fraction of less than 40%. If your uh, end systolic volumes are greater, uh, your survival is less for the same class of EF, whether it's only mildly reduced or moderate to severely reduced. We also know that, that LV ejection fraction, that, that, that number, um, that measurement that we provide on our echo reports guides patient management. This is just a table from the 2017 uh, CCS to heart failure guidelines update, uh, looking at um, uh, scenarios where ejection fraction is recommended uh, to be done. Uh, so, for example, um, in stable heart failure, uh, measurement of LVF uh, approximately every one to three years, uh, and you know if, if it's only mildly reduced, maybe a little bit less frequent. Uh, echo or CMR is uh, the modality of measurement. Of course, echo is is much more readily available in most centers uh, and um, uh, and is probably overall uh, preferable uh, and you're going to see some of the comments here that um, that um, uh, the the information uh, provided uh, from LVF uh, can certainly help with prognosis uh, can help with assigning um, a particular therapy such as a CRT uh, or a ICD uh, implantation um, and uh, might help with uh, patient management and, you know, in the past, I think we would focus LV ejection fraction measurements uh, much more in the setting when there was significant LV systolic dysfunction, uh, you know, particularly uh, when it, the EF is approaching um, uh, the range uh, of consideration of device therapy, such as ICDs or CRT. So in that you know, 30 to 35 percent range, we're much more careful about assessing LV ejection fraction uh, much more wary to quantify LVEF, whereas you know, perhaps if it was only mildly reduced or if it was normal, there'd be less impetus for a lab to actually quantify LVF um, it, with the assumption that you know whether or not the LVF is 55% or 58% or 60% would not make much of a difference with regards to uh, management or with regards to diagnosis of certain uh, conditions. Well, that's changed actually because of now the era of cardio oncology, where we actually care if the LV ejection fraction is 
versus 55 percent weak here if the LDF is uh, reduced but still within normal limits or low normal. So this is um, from the ASE uh, guidelines and from guidelines in general about cancer therapeutics related cardiac dysfunction or CRCT, CT, CRD, uh, sorry, where um, this uh, uh, cancer uh, uh, therapeutics related cardiac dysfunction is defined as a decrease in the LVF of greater than 10% to a value less than 53% which at, at, at this time is the normal reference value uh, for 2D echo Simpson's biplane. Uh, this decrease should be confirmed by repeated cardiac imaging, and the repeat study should be performed two to three weeks after the baseline diagnostic study that showed the initial decrease in LV ejection fraction. So I think the, the era of cardio-oncology has increased uh, our need to quantify LVF uh, on a more regular basis, even when um, uh, LV systolic function is normal or near normal. And it's also the requirement for LV ejection fraction is actually it's also a quality metric um, and is, uh, is recommended uh, from uh, different societies with regards to uh, reporting for example. So uh, for the for the IAC, the Intersocial uh, Accreditation uh, a Group uh, um, uh, they say in their uh, recommendations that the LV size, ejection fraction, presence and absence of regional wall motion abnormalities and diastolic function should be reported. And from in Ontario, the core health uh, working group uh, statement is, is shown here. So assessment of left ventricular dimensions, wall thickness, global LV cell function and ejection fraction. And then when you report the ejection fraction, report the method used um, should be included in the report. And um, you know there are several methods to assess LV ejection fraction. This is from the uh, quantification documents guidelines from the ASC published in 2015, and we know that uh, that uh, that this um, this um, uh, quantification guidelines is actually in the process of being updated. Uh, so we may see some changes, uh, perhaps, in how we quantify LV ejection fraction. Although I don't think there'll be drastic changes. So there, uh, I guess the, the basic um, methods that we've used uh, currently, or at least in the past, includes a couple of uh, linear uh, measurements, whether it's M mode acquired or 2D, or the volumetric methods, uh, such as bi Simpson's biplane and a very infrequently used area length method, which has also been used for assessment of left atrial volumes, for example. Um, the advantages of um, uh, M mode linear measurement um, which I, I think I've, I've gone out of favor uh, for a variety of reasons, is the reproducible high frame rates that we get with M mode. Lots of early uh, uh, data on this uh, and maybe most representative in normal shaped ventricles. But we of course know that uh, frequently uh, that power to long axis where we require that M mode is off axis uh, and um, we may be overestimating the LV dimensions um, and as well a single dimension may not be fully representative uh, in distorted ventricles where there's uh, regional wall motion abnormalities, for example. Um, the 2D linear assessment has the benefits of uh, ensuring that you're perpendicular to the ventricle long axis, but the lower frame rates than M mode um, are a limitation, although in current uh, echo systems now, standard 2D frame rates are actually much better uh, than they were in the past. Now, for this biplane, it does correct for a shape distortion because we're now looking at uh, potential volumes in two different planes and there's less geometric assumptions uh, compared to linear measurements. Some of the limitations are shown here. The apex is frequently foreshortened, which I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, endocardial dropout is important. There were uh, ultrasound enhancing agents uh, may play a role to help. Uh, and we're also blind to shape distortions not visualized um, uh, in the apical two and four chamber views, which are the two views used for the Simpsons biplane. So for example, if, if there's a, um, a focal wall motion abnormality, let's say an aneurysm or an area of akinesis that's in the infolateral wall in the apical three chamber view, for example, but not seen in the apical four, apical two chamber view, we may, be, we may overestimate the LV ejection fraction based on Simpsons biplane, um, 2D at least. Um, and the area-length method I won't touch on because it's really not used very frequently. So the, the linear measurements, either uh, M-motor 2D, uh, the, 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 the 
most common technique is shown in this slide. This is the simplified Quinones method, which you know I recall using uh, when I was a, a cardiology resident and as a um, uh, as an early uh, career um, uh, echocardiographer when I first started at St. Michael's. Um, and this is based on um, the LV and the diastolic and systolic dimension uh, at the base on the parasol walk axis. Uh, with a, a correction for uh, apical abnormalities where you you uh, add or subtract 10% to the EF based on whether or not the apex is normal, hypokinetic, akinetic, or dyskinetic, or if there's an apical aneurysm. Um, uh, this is really, um, this is not recommended anymore um, uh, from the from the ESC guidelines. It's put in as a more of a historical note. It's not recommended. You know, I think it might have uh, some limited utility uh, in day-to-day -day practice, in 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 in, uh, in uh, left ventricles that are globally um, uh, affected, if you have global hypokinesis uh, and, and a relatively symmetric um, uh, abnormality of the left ventricle, um, uh, this may be uh, uh, potentially useful. And I think um, uh, more practically, this is a useful uh, a method of checks and balances. So, for example. If you think the LV ejection fraction is normal, but you do the simplified Kinyonis method uh, and it comes up to be abnormal, then either your uh, dimensions at the base are incorrect or uh, you've made uh, a, uh, uh, an erroneous assessment of the LV ejection fraction. So it, it really helps kind of tailor uh, whether or not we think our visual assessment is um, accurate or not. Uh, this is the Simpsons biplane uh, method from uh, from the uh, the ESC qualification uh, guidelines, um, and I think most people are familiar with this. The other uh, term for the Simpsons biplane is the method of discs, and the the, the reason why it's called the method of discs is is is, is the um, is uh, it, it re reflects the method itself. So what you do is you trace that endocardial border in the apical four and the two chamber view from the mitral annulus shown here at the bottom. Um, uh, around the walls, uh, tracing the endocardium, and you really want to get that compacted endocardium all the way to the apex and around it. You want to exclude papillary muscles, you want to exclude trabeculations, and you want to trace it at end, dast, and end systole. The total volume is calculated from the summation of a stack of elliptical discs. So uh, what the computer does is it divides your tracings into 20 equidistant uh, uh, discs in the apical four and two chamber view, uh, and the height of each disc is one twentieth of the left ventricular length, which is this line down the middle. And then um, you calculate the cross-sectional area of the disc based on those two diameters in the two and the four chamber view. So you calculate the area of each individual disc, and from that area um, of the disc uh, in the four and the two and the height of that disc, you calculate the volume of that disc. Then you add the volumes of that disc to create the LVN diastolic volume and the LVN systolic volume. Uh, and of course, uh, the difference between the two is the total stroke volume. Uh, and then when you divide that by the LVN diastolic volume, you get the LV ejection fraction. Um, a couple of key points here. Um, the, as I mentioned, the volume measurements are uh, based on the tracings of that interface between the compacted myocardium and the LV cavity. So you really do need to have optimal endocardial definition throughout the entire cardiac cycle, ideally from systole to, to diastole, or from diastole to systole. The, the 2D image acquisition should aim to maximize LV area. You want to avoid foreshortening of the left ventricle, um, uh, which results in volume underestimation. And in order to do that, the sonographers will, will usually try you know, one rib space down to see if you can elongate that left ventricle, get that true apex, um, uh, turn the patient well over into the left lateral reticulous position. We know use of cutoff beds um, uh, to allow um, uh, imaging at the true apex of the left ventricle while the patient's in that left lateral reticulous position is helpful. And as well, the sonographers uh, know the, uh, that they uh, can optimally use inspiration, expiration. So I, you know, I know that when you when you hear the sonographers talk to the patients during the studies, you'll 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 hear them say, "Take a breath in, hold it, hold it, hold it," uh, and then they acquire the images and then they breathe out. And sometimes that's an expiration, sometimes that's an inspiration. It all depends on the patient. Um, um, 
The LD uh, volumes, as I mentioned, are derived from the disc diameters of the apical four and the two chamber views. So they're not a simple average of that apical four volume and the apical two chamber volume, uh, which is why you need to do it. Um, uh, you need to do it uh, either at a workstation or online, and, and you can't really do it offline because you don't have that integration. I think the hardest aspect is tracing the compacted myocardium and excluding those trabeculations that, be quite, that can be quite common. And that's really the advantage of, of, of CMR over echocardiography is that ability to uh, look at the compacted myocardium and exclude trabeculations uh, on a more regular basis um, as compared to echocardiography, at least without the use of ultrasound enhancing agents or contrast. The endocardial definition uh, and the last uh, kind of key point and tip, uh, particularly for the sonographers, is that the endocardial definition that the echocardiographers and the physician readers need to assess wall motion, whether our walls are contracting normally if they're hypokinetic, akinetic, and maybe dyskinetic, is not the same level of definition we need for LVEF quantification. You actually need greater definition for quantification of LVEF than you do for endocardial definition. And, and we realize that as readers because um, sometimes we look at the walls and go, yeah, I can see the walls. Uh, I can see if they're contracting normally. And then we try and do a simpsons biplane and we, we stop um, that cardiac cycle. We scroll back to end diastole. We try and trace it. And then we realize that um, we really can't see that endocardial uh, definition as well. We have to scroll back and forth to try and find it. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I, as a reader, sometimes I'll try and do the LVF assessment and I realize, you know, I'm not getting an accurate measurement and I have to delete all the tracings that I have and just use a visual assessment. Um, so, you know, when we're, we're looking at LVEF, um, I think the, the need for endocardial definition and hence the need for use of ultrasound enhancing agents becomes significantly greater. So this is a, a slide that illustrates foreshortening. And this is this is board from uh, uh, um, uh, an image from uh, Barnard Healthcare, um, and so here's the apical four chamber view showing that we're actually cutting through the true apex, and, and in a, a normal ventricle we know it's the true apex because the apex has a very triangular appearance. The endocardium at the apex usually is thinner than at the base, and the LV is long. When you foreshorten, what you do is you actually cut a, a plane that is not through the true apex and is cutting through a distal segment of a wall, whether it's the distal anterior wall here on the apical um, uh, two chamber view, or if it's the four chamber view, maybe the distal anterior lateral wall, for example. And, and we know that we have foreshortening because you have this stubby, uh, rounded apex. We know that the true apex, unless you have an apical aneurysm, the true apex is not round. Uh, it is more triangular. So if you don't have that uh, triangular shape, then, then you know you, you, you're having some degree of foreshortening. We tend to foreshorten the apical two chamber view much more than the four chamber view because of the orientation of the probe versus the orientation of the of the rib spaces. And we know that to get to the from the four to the two chamber view, you have to turn the transducer 90 degrees, uh, and then you, you have to wedge that, that probe in between the rib space um, uh, at its uh, longer axis. Uh, and um, uh, because of that, we sometimes have to go up a rib space and then we need to foreshorten. A uh, couple of extra tips here. And the is the, is uh, defined preferably as the first frame after mitral valve closure. So we, 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 we scroll through the cardiac cycle. We find the first frame after mitral valve closure where the tips of the mitral valve are touching. Uh, and if not, uh, particularly when you use contrast, because you can't necessarily see that mitral valve closure because of um, uh, 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 the, the contrast in the left, uh, left, left ventricular cavity uh, uh, obstructing our view of the thin mitral leaflets, then we'll use the frame of the cardiac cycle in which the respective LV dimension or volume measurement is the largest. And I typically try and use the QRS complex uh, on the ECG tracing as a marker of where end diastole is on average located. If you kind of go right on the, the, the height of the R wave, for example, it should be very close uh, to end diastole. And since he has specified this the frame after aortic valve closure, uh, which unfortunately we can't see on the apical four or the two chamber view, and I usually tend to use the frame in which the dimension or the volume is the smallest, uh, recognizing that sometimes it can be a challenge 
particularly in um, the synchronous LV. So, for example, the LV with left bundle branch block, when we know that ends uh, at end systole, sometimes the lateral wall is coming in or it's maximal excursion, but the septum has already started to relax because of that conduction building. Um, we have reference values for a, a, a 2D a, a volumes and ejection fraction uh, based on uh, Simpson's biplane um, uh, uh, from the guidelines. Um, uh, LV and uh, diastolic volumes of 74 mils per meter squared for men, 61 mils per meter squared for women, and systolic 31 uh, mils per meter squared for men, 24 for women. Uh, and, and, and of course, we use two standard deviations above that that normal average to know when, when it's abnormal. Um, uh, LV ejection fraction, uh, uh, less than 52% for men, less than 54% for women are suggestive of abnormal LV cell function based on what we do before uh, for the ESC uh, 2015 guidelines. These may change actually, uh, and these may change because of the WAYS study. The WAY study is the World um, Alliance of Echo Societies Evaluation Study that was uh, uh, completed uh, in 2018-2019. Uh, 2019. Um, and many labs uh, across the world participated in this. And this is, this is just a large um, registry-based study of normal echocardiograms. Patients were excluded um, if they had any significant cardiac abnormalities, you know, such as hypertension, such as coronary disease, prior myocardial infarction, et cetera. And this is data from um, one of the ways um, publications from JACE 2019, focusing uh, mainly on the left ventricle. Uh, and you can see here uh, with the, 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 the bottom, the second to last line, uh, LV ejection fraction percentage in men and women shown here. You can see um, that in women, it tends to be slightly greater, at least statistically significantly greater. And the range of normals is 57 to 68% uh, percent for men, 58 to 69% for women. Um, and the old guidelines, the 2015 guidelines, is shown here on the left, and it was 52 to 72%. So, uh, we, you know, whether or not, you know, right now we tend to use 55% as our cutoff of, of normal LV ejection fractions. Um, and whether or not that's going to increase, let's say, to 57%, uh, we'll see what the, the quantification guidelines uh, come up with or whether they leave at 55. Um, but, uh, but, but this may change. And from the way study, we may be able to have, um, uh, on top of having uh, sex-specific cutoffs, we may have uh, ethnic-specific cutoffs. For example, if you're Asian, South Asian, uh, African, uh, et cetera, Caucasian, uh, Black, uh, you may have different cutoffs. Uh, for uh, dimensions, volumes, and ejection fraction. So um, here are some of the advantages and disadvantages or limitations of the, 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 the volumetric measures. Simpson's biplane 2D with and without contrast. Um, the contrast, of course, helps with suboptimal acoustic windows. And it does, the studies have shown that it does provide volumes that are closer to those measured with CMR. Um, it is blind to shape the storage, as I mentioned before, not visualized on the apical four and two chamber view. And as well with contrast, you do have that acoustical shadowing at the basal segments with excessive use of contrast, but there, there are ways to, uh, to uh, get around that. I'll mention some of those a little bit later. Uh, with 3D echo, um, you know, you don't have uh, to worry about geometric assumptions. Um, you can avoid uh, uh, force shortening uh, if you get a true uh, 3D volume, and it's been shown to be more accurate and reproducible compared to other uh, uh, echo uh, uh, modalities uh, and more reflective of, of, of CMR, uh, which is the non-invasive gold standard for LD volumes and LD ejection fraction. It does have a low temporal resolution that's improving with probe technology improvements. There's less published data on normal values and ways with really predominantly 2D echocardiography, and it's very highly image quality dependent. You really need fantastic image quality in order to get um, a good quality 3D volumetric uh, data. Uh, GLF, uh, I think, is an emerging technique that we're using, particularly with, with cardio oncology. Uh, there's still a degree of error with, uh, with current 2D straight techniques. There's, there's more and more established prognostic value, and it may be a more sensitive marker of LV systolic function as compared to LV ejection fraction. So strain may reduce early, especially in cardio oncology patients. 
uh, and may be predictive of later drops in LV injection fraction. Um, the limitation currently is that there is vendor uh, specific aspects to strain, uh, and if you're following a patient for strain, um, you may have to use the same vendor um, because they might have slightly different normal values. Um, just a couple of slides on, on contrast. Um, many studies in the past have shown the value of contrast in echocardiography. Um, a, a Hundley study on the left uh, showing that the number of segments uh, visualized and wall motion is concordant with MRI increases with the use of contrast from 76% to 91%. And from MOM published in Jack in 2004, looking at end and systolic and injection fraction measurements in uh, non-contrast echo versus contrast echo versus MRI. You can see with contrast echo, the volumes tend to be greater in cystic and diastole because we're actually getting the true compacted myocardium uh, as compared to MRI. And, and uh, um, uh, uh, from that MALM study, the bland alpha plots, uh, when you compare um, the variability between echo and MRI, this is unenhanced echo versus enhanced or contrast echo, you can see the 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 um, um, the the uh, 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 widths of disagree widths of agreement. Sorry, with the bland alpha plot gets gets much tighter uh, and is reduced with contrast as opposed to uh, non-contrast, showing that the agreement is better and the variability is less. This is a study from Eric Yu published in JAYS 2000, looking at contrast echo. Uh, injection fraction measurements uh, compared to uh, MUGA scanning or radionuclide angiography showing correlation increases uh, uh, from fundamental to harmonic imaging because of better endocardial definition increase even further with the use of contrast with harmonics with our values going from 0.59 to 0.89 to 0.97. Just one case to illustrate um, the use of, of contrast um, uh, for uh, LV systolic function assessment to apical four, uh, sorry, uh, parasol long axis and, and parasol short axis. Um, you can see uh, uh, actually hyperdynamic systolic function, almost cavity obliteration in the, in the parasol long and the short axis here. And you know, so far you think, oh yeah, the LV ejection fraction is, is, is normal, uh, probably uh, above normal, maybe in that 65, 70% range. Now, when you get to the apical four and the two chain review, you, 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 obviously there's a there's a drop off in um, the quality of um, uh, the endocardial definition, uh, and uh, you can see that the apex is not well seen. That lateral wall is not well seen, uh, and um, you know none of the walls are really well seen uh, in the four and the two chain review. Um, you can also see uh, the point I was, that, that I mentioned earlier. You can see the foreshortening of the apex. Um, uh, with the two chamber view compared to the four chamber view, although you're getting a bit of the aortic valve, so maybe a bit into the five chamber view, a little bit too much anterior angulation. Uh, but, but you can see that the, the, the length of the left ventricle is significantly shorter in the two chamber view on the right compared to the four chamber view on the left, uh, and that's foreshortening. Uh, but overall, you know, I think most of us would say that LV ejection fraction looks normal, you know, no clear wall motion abnormalities. We really, we include a statement that you can't exclude subtle wall motion abnormalities because of poor endocardial definition. So this patient had a, a, a contrast uh, 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 with their study, uh, and um, you can actually now more clearly see that while the basal and mid segments are hyperdynamic, when you get to the distal segments and the apex, as you can see, the wall motion abnormality um, with almost uh, akinesis, maybe even slight dyskinesis at the true apex. Uh, the four chamber view on the left, two chamber view on the right. And as well, you can see how the how you've now been able to, the sonographer has been able to lengthen that left ventricle. So now we're actually seeing the true apex and that apical wall motion of the body. Of course, you want to confirm that another view here is the apical three chamber view. So once again, distal anterior septum, distal um, uh, infralateral wall, hypokinetic, uh, akinetic to mild dyskinesis of the apex. And you can see you really can't see it well on that apical three chamber view without contrast. Uh, probably also be because of the degree of foreshortening of that apex. So a really nice example of the utility of, 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 of contrast for assessment of wall motion and, and, and probably increased accuracy for LV ejection fraction assessments. So um, from the um, contrast guidelines published in, um, in uh, uh, 20, uh, 
think it was 18. Um, no, it's probably a little bit earlier. Um, and this is the most recent one. Um, you know, we really don't have good normative data for, for contrast volumes and ejection fraction. Um, there's a couple of small studies that were integrated into the contrast guidelines. Um, and so the guidelines recommended uh, uh, and proposed an end diastolic volume upper limit cutoff of 83 for women and 98 for men based on a small uh, a study uh, of contrast in normal patients. Uh, and um, using two standard deviations above uh, that normative data uh, leads to better agreement with CMR when we use contrast echo. Uh, but the writing group did emphasize the need for larger prospective studies to define ranges for LV volumes observed with uh, ultrasonic health agents. Just a couple of brief slides on 3D before we get to a number of cases, which I'll finish off with. So we know that um, that 3D uh, has really evolved. You know, initially, when it started, it was a, a tedious, kind, time-consuming offline reconstruction of multiple serial 2D loops to now full-time, um, you know, real-time acquisition of 3D parameter data sets, full volume acquisition, uh, fundamental imaging to harmonic imaging with 3D. We have improved resolutions, better frame rates, larger sectors uh, to full volume loops. Uh, even in more dilated left ventricles. There's 3D color Doppler imaging and of course 3 dt which we use routinely, especially in our structural heart uh, evaluations. Uh, this is just some, a slide showing the utility of a 3D echo for proper alignment of the LV and avoiding uh, for shortening so we can adjust uh, the planes to, um, uh, to uh, uh, get the true apex uh, when we measure 3D volumes and 3D ejection fraction. And a number of studies, this was one study by Lisa, Lisa Sujang when she was with Roberto Lang in Chicago looking at uh, 3D echocardiography volumes and ejection fractions compared to the gold standard of CMR. Uh, really tight correlations uh, and very little uh, variability between uh, 3D um, uh, uh, echo and MRI. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I would say that, uh, that the, 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 the gold standard uh, eventually for echo should be 3D with contrast. Uh, you know, I think that there's a number of uh, groups working uh, on this, uh, and there have been a few studies on 3D contrast, but in, in real life, uh, it's, 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 it's quite challenging and definitely not ready for prime time, uh, but hopefully in the future as the technology improves. Okay, so I'm going to show a couple of cases and, uh, and then we'll finish off and hopefully get, get a chance for some questions. I would have loved to have audience participation. Um, I'm not sure if that is possible, uh, but if anybody wants to, to, to pipe up uh, and uh, unmute and, and provide any comments, uh, please uh, please go ahead and just uh, just interrupt me. So this is, um, uh, let's say this is a cardio-oncology patient uh, and you want to get uh, LV ejection fraction measurements in the apical four and two chamber view. And I would say that this is very good to excellent quality in the cardio. There probably is some trabeculations that you see here. I don't think the based on just experience and probably experience from looking at contrast and non-contrast echocardiography, this is not true endocardium. The true endocardium is probably a little bit below that uh, here. Um, uh, and it, just the appearance of it here, uh, it looks a little bit shaggier. Um, it's, it's coming in a little bit more compared to some of the other walls. And it doesn't follow the shape of a normal ventricle. So this is, this is almost integration of, of, of human um, intelligence. This is not artificial or machine intelligence. This is this is human intelligence from learnings uh, of echocardiographers over time. Uh, but this is optimal quality. I don't think you know we see all the segments well on the apical four to the review. There's relatively little dropout. You can see the true apex. Um, so I wouldn't recommend using contrast in this setting per se. Um, uh, although I think contrast would, would probably add a little bit of incremental advantage in terms of tracing this. Um, you also see that the ventricles are relatively same length, uh, and you can see the nice triangular appearance of the apex uh, here in this normal ventricle. Uh, and you know, I think the two chamber view is is not for sure. But this is this is like almost a perfect image. This is like the poster child uh, for measurement. So and so here's the next slide. We'll show the measurements that that I that I did, uh, and you know. I, I, I'd love to hear what, what the fellows and the uh, attendings think about these tracings here. I generally try and trace uh, close to 
the interface between what what I would say is the white endocardium and the black cavity all the way to the apex, um, recognizing that there's normally trabeculations at the apex and at that lateral wall, that anterior wall. I go on a little bit behind these trabeculations. I don't go all the way to the epicardium. I know some readers go to the epicardium, but I recognize that um, you know a lot of wall thickening actually occurs in the endocardium, and that if you only trace the epicardium then you might underestimate the LV and systolic volume and underestimate LV ejection fraction. And here's my tracings for, um, uh, for and systole. Um, so once again, this is all trabeculations coming in. Um, and this is just from, from, from experience uh, and it certainly can be proven with, with contrast. Here's a two chamber view, and systole and diastole. I, and I'll mention this a little bit later, uh, is that I think the novice tracer, the, you know, I'm one of the reviewers for Core Health, the ECHO working group. Um, I tend to review more when there's discrepancies between initial reviewers. And uh, the, one of the more common um, pitfalls and errors made in tracings in, in many labs, including academic as well as community labs, is the undertracing of, of, of volumes because we're tracing trabeculations. We're tracing too far into that cavity or we're tracing around uh, papillary muscles, for example. So a couple of key points and tips on this. So I think it's important to choose that right loop and the right cardiac cycle to measure end and systole. I typically measure the same cardiac cycle. I would avoid measuring end diastole from one cardiac cycle and end systole from another cardiac cycle. Um, you want to choose the representative uh, uh, cardiac cycle from most of the cardiac cycles avoid ectopic beats, so avoid VPBs or PACs. And importantly, you want to avoid that post-ectopic beats. We know that post-PAC and post-VPB, you have that compensatory pause, and that next beat, if there's myocardial viability, the ejection fraction will increase um, because of increased contractility for that beat. So you really want to, want to have uh, the preceding beat be a normal cardiac cycle. So you really do need essentially two beats in a row of, uh, of normal sinus rhythm ideally. With atrial fibrillation or irregular rhythms, you want to choose a representative beat where the R interval isn't too fast, isn't too slow, or you do the painstaking method of averaging five cardiac cycles. And in a busy lab, um, I can't remember the last time I measured five cardiac cycles uh, in Sissi and Dasi to, to, um, to uh, do a quant EF in um, atrial fibrillation. Um, if you do uh, measure, uh, do uh, be sure to mention beat-to-beat uh, -beat variability, especially if the atrial fibrillation is very irregular. And we know that even in sinus rhythm, there's a little bit of beat-to-beat -beat variability um, in um, contractility, uh, sometimes based on, 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 on sinus arrhythmia, for example. Um, but we know that does occur. As I mentioned before, you want to avoid trabeculations or muscle bundles. And that's really one of the values of ultrasound enhancing agents. And as I mentioned, we, uh, we actually tend to undertrace. Uh, too much into the LV cavity, but also would avoid overtracing as well. We're tracing that bright epicardium. Okay, so here's a here's a, a, a an image uh, of the same patient with or without contrast. And this is what I mentioned before: is that as we use contrast more, we, we have a better of idea of where the endocardium is um, typically underneath the trabeculation. So here you can see. So a novice reader would trace here the septum would go appropriately um, uh, at, uh, at that interface between that white, bright endocardium uh, and the cavity all the way to the apex, but would probably start tracing here and into here and come down here. But look at the contrast image on the right. You can see now you've outlined the true apex, and this is a beautiful contrast image. You, you can see that the, the myocardium is relatively dark, Septum is a little bit brighter. We tend to have that septal stripe sometimes, um, but you can still see you know, really nice endocardial definition. And you can see how that contrast goes right through these trabeculations to the compacted or the true endocardium. You can get a hint of the trabeculations because they tend to be a little hazy here. Um, and that potentially is a value with, with looking at non-compaction, for example. But you can see that the, you, you can recognize from this image that the compacted of the cardiac is actually here, which is over here, and it's not here. This is trabeculations. Okay, so here's a case. So parasitic lower axis, if we go four, two, and three chamber view. So here the LVEF is clearly abnormal. 
Um, it looks global to me with regional variability. There might be a little bit of the synergy uh, by the real conduction delay, um, uh, for example, or non specific conduction delay. Um, uh, and you can see foreshortening of the of the apical feature in the view. Uh, probably trabeculations as well, uh, that will make it challenging. So this is uh, the type of, uh, of study where you know, I would recommend using ultrasound enhancing matrix. And you can see here, um, this is the GE system um, where um, uh, perhaps maybe not quite as optimized um, uh, compared to, to Philips, for example, but that's actually, this is actually a pretty good uh, quality contrast image, relatively dark endocardium uh, uh, and bright, nice cavity. Bit of attenuation at the base of the apical free chain of view, but um, uh, you can actually see the endocardium fairly well here. So, you know, based on, on this image here, what we see of the endocardium versus here, you, you know, you could definitely see the endocardium better and you can definitely trace better, you can get a better visual assessment, you can get a better quantitative assessment of the LV jacket factor. And let's make sure, yeah. So this is the same case. So this is the apical four chamber view without contrast, with contrast. Um, just to show you, you can trace the endocardium here all the way up here and around here. You can here you can see the trabeculations in the background, which you don't trace, you trace behind the trabeculations with true compacted uh, 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 endocardium. And here's a two chamber view. You can see a bit of the papillosal here, lots of oh, sorry, I apologize. This is, a, this is a different case. This is the apical four chamber view with uh, case three. A bit more trabeculations here, the lateral wall, that anterolateral papillosal here. You can see that big anterolateral papillosal trabeculations, the true compacted myocardium. Here's that two chamber view. Probably a bit of foreshortening in the non contrast, left foreshortening with the contrast images. Once again, you can see the trabeculations here where the, the, the myocardium looks thick. Here it looks a lot thinner and then lastly because you're now getting to that true compacted myocardium. Um, a couple of tips and tricks. So beware of that, that right wall, beware of that anterolateral wall on the apical four chamber view, that anterior wall on the apical two chamber view. These walls and the apex tend to have more trabeculations as compared to the inflow septum or the apical four or the inferior wall or the apical two. The papillary muscles are commonly seen, particularly that anterolateral pap muscle in the apical four chamber view. Depending on how you angle it, you might get that anterolateral pap muscle in the anterior wall or the two chamber view, but more commonly you tend to see that post-tribedal pap muscle or the two chamber view. Um, and of course, you see both pap muscles, uh, unless there's a very distorted left ventricle, you're probably uh, off axis on that two chamber view. Um, and don't forget uh, that, um, that that right side wall, that anterior lateral wall of the apical four, the anterior wall of the apical two chamber view, there uh, tend to be away from the center of the beam. And we know as you get further away from that center of the beam, you have that lower spatial resolution when you go more laterally, especially since the endocardium is parallel to the, the, to the transistor beam. So here's a, a, a fourth case uh, um, uh, of uh, a patient, pretty decent endocardial definition um, overall, maybe good enough for a qualitative, but probably not good enough for quantitative of the EF assessment. You need to lose a bit of that lateral wall here. Two chamber is actually pretty good, not for short. You see you lose that info lateral wall over here um, uh, on the three chamber view. Um, and you know, when you look at this, you know, the, all the walls look to be contracting, uh, whether or not they're contracting normally or, or, or uh, optimally is, is questionable. Uh, and, you know, I think some echocardiographers would call this normal, some would call this low normal, some might call this borderline global or mild global hypokinesis, uh, and, uh, and that's based on visual assessment. Um, here with contrast, it really allows you to see the endocardial definition better, and um, you can definitely see the anterior wall, the inferior wall, you can see that lateral wall contracting, where we didn't see it before, you can see that inferior wall, lateral wall contracting, where we didn't see it before. So if you take a look at these walls contracting, and you can definitely trace it. Let's look at that for a few seconds. Let's go back. And all readers are a little bit different. So to me, 
here I might be more inclined to call borderline global hypokinesis no normal. And here, with seeing the walls better, I think that the contractility looks a little bit better than I appreciated on the, the non contrast. Um, and uh, I would probably call this normal. At the very worst, I would call this no normal. The LVEF with tracings here quantified to 55%. So right at that cusp of normal, which, which kind of fits the visual eye as well. Howard, it's Bob. Yeah, Bob. Um, just the, the one thing looking at that, looking at that last one. Yep. One of the things I look at is on the that one, yeah, is the mitral valve, especially on the long axis view. Doesn't the anterior leaflet doesn't really work, you know, go up to the septum, which I like it to see it do, or get, you know, within a sonometer of the septum. When I see that, I start thinking this ventricle might be down a bit. Yeah, no, that's um, it kind so of back to the early EMBO days, right? Yeah, well, if the anterior leaf of the mitral valve is more than a sonometer from the septum, you start thinking about LB dysfunction. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, obviously, particularly in the presence of a, a completely normal mitral valve, for example. Now, having said that, you can see dilatation of the left ventricle. Uh, with normal ejection fraction or near normal ejection fraction, and that dilatation, you know, might also lead to a decreased excursion of the of the mitral valve, just in terms of displacement. So here's the four in the two chain review. Okay, um, so it's a couple of uh, extra key tips and points here. So I think, um, you know, I think most echocardiographers are used to visual assessment. That's their bread and butter. Um, and a lot of us, you know, trained in the era where it was really all visual assessment. I think many people remember the, the grades, grade one, two, three, and four, which is a, a Toronto-centric um, uh, um, uh, uh, reporting uh, grade one being greater than 60 percent, grade two 20, uh, 40 to 60 percent, grade three uh, 20 to 40 percent, grade four less than 20 percent. Uh, but you can imagine in today's world a, a range of 20 percent is a very very wide range of EF measurements. It makes it easy to report, right? That because uh, you can it's a huge number of EFs that go into that one bucket. Um, uh, but uh, I think we need to be a bit tighter in our um, EF assessments. Uh, and so generally, when we do the census by play, we would like to see that uh, LDF fit that visual assessment. And if it doesn't fit, meaning that if you do the tracings and you go, oh, that number doesn't fit what I think is going on when I look at all the all the um, all the all the images, then you have to examine the tracings. You know, are there any errors? Did you trace trabeculations? Is there a dropout? Are you not seeing the endocardium as well as you thought you did? How good is that endocardial visualization? And then if you determine the, the tracings are suboptimal and you didn't use contrast, or if you used contrast and the, the tracings are still suboptimal for a variety of reasons, then maybe maybe best just to delete the tracings and just report a visual EF. Uh, ideally in a range of five to 10%, so 40 to 45%, 45 to 50%. At the very worst, I report 45 plus or minus 5% or 40 plus or minus 4%. So no more than a range of 10%. Um, uh, for uh, uh, yeah, and if you if you have to go beyond ten percent, then I would say um, you know it might be best to have a statement saying the LV is not LVF is not normal, but you can't quantify. Um, it might be best just to say that. Or if you find the tracings are of good quality, then I think you, you're probably better off going with the quant LVF, recognizing that you want to make sure that that that, that, um, that there's that's fairly symmetrical abnormalities, for example, and you're not you, you're not missing a significant wall motion abnormality in the apical three chain review example. If the tracings are of good quality, then I would say go with the quant LVF and then retrain your eye, um, because I think um, you know I think you could be very consistent with your qualitative assessments, but you could be systematically over or underestimating EF if you don't have that quality check or quality metric 
of tracings because you get very good internal consistency when you read studies and you go, yeah, I always call EFs around this when I see this. If you don't retrain it with quantitative LDFs, then you may have a systematic error in your reporting. You may be very consistent in your EF reporting, but you may have a systematic error of plus or minus five to 10%. Um, and we also have challenges with integration of very different extremes of regional wall motion. I remember talking to the fellows yesterday. I think we're very good at integrating EFs where walls are hypokinetic or akinetic. But if you have a very diskinetic segment, I think we're, we're I think we're challenged with subtracting EF. Or if you have very hyperkinetic segments, uh, we have difficulty uh, adding uh, ejection fraction points uh, to offset that. So if you have, and the worst is when you have hyperkinetic basal segments and completely diskinetic apical segments um, to do a visual EF. And the classic Takosubo's cardiomyopathy that David Dorian talked about last week. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, you're better off quantifying uh, when you have those extremes of wall motion abnormalities. Um, just a couple of extra points, the, the early versus late after uh, ultra enhancing. So you can tell this is early because concentration is fairly high. You get a bit of basal attenuation here, but it's early and the contrast hasn't quite gotten into the capillaries of the myocardium, so the myocardium is relatively dark. Later on, you can see the contrast has actually filled the myocardium and, you, and the myocardium is relatively brighter and you lose a bit of that, that endocardial definition, that nice black-white interface. And this is the value of giving one or two flashes of high-power ultrasound during imaging, clear that myocardium, you, know, you don't clear the LV, and then you get back to this um, image where you have dark myocardium uh, and bright cavity. And that's the use of the flash. I love that first couple of beats after injection uh, of contrast with the apical portion. Really. So you definitely want to capture that because it tends to be one of the best images that you capture. And in our lab, actually, we started actually capturing early to capture the right ventricle. I've noted that uh, to, to look at RV uh, assessment uh, before it gets too high and you get all this attenuation. Um, if you have um, attenuation at the base, which you see here in the apical portion, if you can see in diastole, New contrast comes in through that mitral valve, and, um, and uh, 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 um, uh, really um, you can't see the basal segments very well. So you just wait. So this is just one. It's a few seconds after it gets a little bit better. A few seconds after it gets a little better, and after you know four or five seconds it gets perfect. You can actually see right down to the base. You can see the mitral annulus, and if you have to stop and trace, you can definitely do that here, where it might be difficult getting that basal segments um, uh, early after contrast. You can also use a flash to destroy bubbles to decrease concentration a little bit faster. Uh, but of course, you don't want to flash too much and then have to give. Last couple of tips. Um, so uh, and this is a bit of a wrap up. Um, you know, ideally, you want to be able to quantify LVEF uh, when able to do so with reasonable accuracy. Uh, so ideally 100%. And we tend to quantify LVF more when we have better undercardial definition, particularly with ultrasound enhancing agents when we don't. Um, if you do re resort to qualitative EF assessment, uh, provide a range, ideally within 5%, maximum up to 10%, do not report grades. Do not report grade 1, 2, 3, or 4. Um, currently, 2D Simpsons biplane with or without contrast for endocardial definition is the gold standard. You know, we'll see how 3D goes over the next couple of years, but you really do need to see the endocardium. Um, uh, and for 3D and 2D strain, increasingly used, but you need excellent image quality, which unfortunately we don't get that uh, in, um, in the majority of our patients, unfortunately. We didn't talk much about regional wall motion because um, I wanted to focus mainly on EF, but we know that, uh, that regional wall motion assessment is one of the key aspects of uh, looking at uh, uh, systolic function. You want to focus on thickening. You want to look at multiple views, ideally at least two orthogonal views to see that same wall motion abnormality. And you want to read with coronary anatomy in mind, um, uh, examine adjacent segments, uh, keeping in mind unusual patterns such as tacosubo cardiomyopathy, for example. So for example, if you see an apical wall motion abnormality, make sure you pay close attention to that anterior wall, pay close attention to that anterior septum. If you see an inferior abnormality, look at that infolateral wall, look at that basal infoseptum, you know, think coronary anatomy-like. Um, okay. 
So I'm going to stop there, Chi Ming. Um, sorry, I don't think I left a lot of time for questions. My apologies, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. Once again, I want to thank uh, Howard for giving such a beautiful and comprehensive lecture on this uh, topic. It is fundamental and core to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I have a quick question about um, what, what do you think about the um, um, assessment of LVEF using artificial intelligence? And, and uh, right now we're using edge detection method uh, at this point, proved um, uh, programs out there, especially on the poker side. So do you want to just comment on whether it's actually possible? Yeah, I, I think it depends on, you know, it depends on the method that artificial intelligence uses to to um, assess EF. If it's reliant on endocardial definition and tracings, then I think you're going to need excellent endocardial definition. Uh, and, um, you know, use of contrast, I think, will be will be very helpful with regards to that. Uh, if it's using other things, uh, such as, you know, what Bob talked about, the exclusion of the anterior of the mitral valve, um, and looking at other uh, aspects of, um, of echocardiography to predict LV ejection fraction measurements, then it may work out better. Um, it's kind of like you, you, everyone has seen those studies of uh, quantification of LVF based on uh, artificial intelligence of the ECG, right? So just uh, it, it's picked up things on the ECG that's allowed um, uh, assessment of LVEF that has nothing to do with 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 the walls. So it's possible that. You know, artificial intelligence can pick up something on echocardiography um, that has relatively little to do with with how much the endocardium moves. But if it's endocardial definition, then I think you're going to need um, a good endocardial definition. So I think with contrast um, with our, and artificial intelligence, I think it, I think that probably has the best bet to succeed. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Actually, most of the AI algorithms are not particularly. Um, uh, performed on the contrast images. There are some abstract that I've seen and posters, but uh, still like, you know, far. You, you think that it may be closer than what we think, but it's still actually quite far, despite this is fundamental to what we do every day. So I think right now we're coming up to 901. And uh, uh, thank you so much for actually uh, putting this together. And it's very comprehensive, very important to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure many people will come back to this presentation and, and uh, review it. So thank you and uh, have a wonderful day, everyone.